Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Anurekha Chari Vag, Assistant Professor, Department of Sociology, Savitri Bhai Phule, Pune University. Today we are going to discuss the module title, Peasant and the Raj, Part 2. This module is part of the paper, Agrarian Social Structure and Change. This paper is coordinated by Dr. Manish Thakur of IIM Kolkata. In this module titled Peasant and the Raj 2, we are going to focus on the theoretical understanding of peasant life. And this theoretical understanding would be developed through looking at the works of 19th century thinkers. In this 19th century thinkers, we are going to focus on the works of Maine, Karl Marx, Bowden and Powell, especially in the way they have constructed the notion of village within Indian context. Further, trying to understand through their work how social change in India has really helped to redefine the way we understand villages in India. Containing the discussion presented in module 2.2a, in this module we talk about the discursive effects of the Raj's land revenue policy and the increasing salience of colonial forms of knowledge. We also offer you an overview of how the Raj's going involvement with the Indian peasant life catapulted some of the basic categories of understanding of Indian socio-economic institutions in the domain of social theory of the day. Throughout our discussion, we try to integrate the changes in land revenue policies and land settlement practices with the concomitant changes in a way of looking at how Indian peasants have historically organized the community and economic life. We also introduced you to different ways in which Raj's understanding of peasant life seeped into a general theoretical understanding of Indian social institutions. The making of an agrarian territory. It is misleading to assume that the village has always been a basic unit for revenue collection. At times, revenue would be settled on the basis of smaller estates within villages. Likewise, many a times larger estates comprising several villages would be the basis for revenue settlement. Marriott has shown how for the first time the whole countryside was divided into village units for administration with reference to Mahalwari system of land tenure. In his directions for revenue officers, James Tom Mason directed that wherever possible the whole body of proprietors in each village would be made individually and collectively responsible for paying that land tax. This was a novel requirement as previous Mughal policy had often been to recognize estates as units even when they cut across several villages. In the new system, one finds some sort of disposition to treat each village as if they were a great family. In this sense, the modern ideas of territorial organization of land based on revenue village are said to be derived from colonial times. In fact, this was true for the whole of colonial Asia. Thus, in India, as much as the colonized world, village became the linchpin in the overall colonial regulation of agrarian territory. It helped the new rulers in the settlement of farming regions in Sindh with the laws of landed property and policies of revenue collection. In 1815, the colonial rulers had settled upon the village as a basic unit of agrarian administration. While overhauling the earlier territorial organization and erasing the traces of previous form of territorial organizations, the British rule enshrined the village community as a core economic, political and social unit. This projection of the village as an elemental unit of Indian socio-economic organization subserved several functions. In ideological terms, village came to be represent a survival of agrarian tradition and administrative foundation of agrarian modernity. The territory called India became traditional and the village and the family farm became its elemental unit. The cultural construct called India came to rest on the idea that one basic cultural logic did in fact recognize organized agriculture in its constituent village territories from ancient to modern time. This attempt to create a new type of unified agrarian territory around the idea of village was bound to dislodge earlier conceptions of the village. As the British went about mapping and surveying every inch of the agrarian territory and organized it in terms of the cellular units of the village, they inflicted enormous violence on those conceptualizations that considered village as locales of social power outside the state. Even today, there is a persistent discrepancy between what the state calls village and what the villages think village is. A survey of historical literature tells us that in terms of local political power structures, village per se was not universally the key unit. In older days, powerful notables determined where one revenue village ended and another began. The state did not have so direct say in deciding land rights. Until the 1870s, many struggles for the control of land occurred outside the purview of the state. 
In the few cases, land rights were granted as part of the remuneration of the state functionaries. There was a curious amalgam of land rights and official status. Moreover, people with rights to land exercised various types and degrees of power over the local territory and its inhabitants. In other words, boundaries maintained fuzzy between local politics, society, law, police and administration as land rights were the chief lever of power. In a restricted sense, those who control land also control much of civic and judicial administration. In brief, historically, the village was, has not been a unit for economic administration or political representation. Under the colonial dispensation, the definition and delimitation of localities were no longer the handiwork of powerful families and caste groups. They assumed an official institutional form even when the village communities were organized around socially dominant landed families. They became a part of the administrative jurisdiction of urban centers that house government offices. Village as organized was thought appropriate for modernization under the joint auspices of the market economy and state policies. It was remolded in the hope of unleashing its progressive potential while dismantling old bottlenecks, such as ambiguity and confusion about land rights, prohibitive social controls and the dominance of caste, sect and other forms of cultural collectivity. The then prevailing theories of culture and modernization fueled the distinctive shaping of the Indian village and tried to naturalize it as an essential component of the new agrarian social order. The shaping of the village was largely the outcome of the supposed theoretical opposition that had thus emerged between the Europe's competitive individualist rationalism and Asia's collective traditional peasant community consciousness. This theoretical dualism has always highlighted the cooperative and harmonious aspects of the ontology of the village while underplaying its internal diversity and conflict. In the colonialist reading, village communities formed solid collective identities with closed unitary moral economies. There were other factors which made the village the basic unit of Indian society. In consolidating the rule over India, the British encountered an all pervasive customary rights and practices associated with the land. The control of land was at the core of an unusually long and complicated chain of patron and client relationship. These multilayered claims of land and the control of the landed gentry on a proportion of levied taxation and the appropriation of undue political administrative powers at the local level appeared to be dispensable nuisances to a highly technocratic character of colonial bureaucracy. Firstly, the British were inspired by a quest for an orderly exercise of authority and determination to prevent the siphoning of the obligations in cash and the kind from the population by supra-local laws. As their intervention in the native society and economy increased, they were forced to encounter a complex social arrangement and institutional frameworks crisscrossing the village. The latter's mechanistic adherence to rules and regulations left little allowance for the customs of the land. Projecting village as a key unit helped them to get rid of a feudally structured intermediate third sphere between the state and the people full of wide range of large and small middlemen. Furthermore, village reified in a closed and inwardly oriented agrarian settlement helped them to justify their efforts as a means to restore original bipolar situation. Secondly, by making the village the organizing principles of society, the British assured themselves getting back the local administrative and political overheads from the village as collectivity. As Bremen puts it, restoration of the so-called tradition can be explained with some justification as a principle of cheap government. Lastly, the projection of local economy and administration as a village avoided the need to split up the rural habitants into various categories with different or even contradictory needs and interests. In retrospect, the singular absence of internal affairs of the village as subject of research and policy uh, making corroborates this. Colonial research came to a halt at the village boundary and did not penetrate its inner domain, notwithstanding many administrative instances where more concrete information was hastily superficially collected. Colonial Typology of Civilizations In the charged 19th century debate, the village was seen not merely as a historical relic but was imbued with much contemporary relevance. For the Westerners, village communities stood for a world that they had lost, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, the changes it had generated. Since it was a world almost lost, depending upon one's ideological predictions, it could be embedded in one's own version of progress or degeneration in relation to the present. For the romantic idyllic villages of the past realized those qualities of life that they highly valued and craved for, and for which could indeed be realized in some future utopia. Those who were on the side of progress, there were many set out to debunk the idyllic myth of past village community by associating it with economic inequality or 
rigidly stratified and stagnant society and its historic subordination to arbitrary powers. As history and progress were unremitting preoccupations of the 19th century Victorian mind, the conceptualization of village in this framework was only an instance of a larger problematic that turned on a lack of commitment to progress. In effect, the Raj tried to legitimize their presence in India by designating the village community as a basis of colonial policy. That is, a colonial construction of village was embedded in the principle of territoriality which formed the basis of colonial organization of power. By making village all important, they could frequently claim to restore a pristine institution that had fallen from grace by the tyranny of the native despotic rulers. This also imparts to the British the credit for having brought to fore a tradition which was unknown to Indians themselves. In this sense, colonialism as a form of knowledge has shaped much of the modern history of colonized places and peoples. It went on to amass knowledge to enable itself to classify, categorize and bound the vast social world that was India so that it could be controlled. Inden gives an ideological explanation for the new preoccupation of the village as a basic formation of the Indian society. He argues that the Orientalist perspective that had gained currency during the 19th century placed European modernity in an hierarchical relationship with the Asiatic tradition. Thus, India's unchanging institutions based on family, caste and the village communities were constructed as empirical indicators of the presence or absence of progress. In other words, Indian village were seen in the light of general consensus animating Western historiography. Certain universal features constructed as markers of progress, that is the presence of private property in land for instance, were mainly looked on for the historic constitution in the village. It was this empirical quest for markers of progress or their lack of which made India and Europe appear as braided concerns which in turn also signals entry of Indian village into the domain of European social theory. Not surprisingly, the Indian village as a unique institution inhabited by the peasants came to inform the intellectual currents of the British society itself. Main and the discovery of the Aryan village. From the early decades of the 19th century, village community had embodied a remarkable interaction between Western and Indian minds and data. In fact, it had never ceased to be a shuttlecock to radical and conservative battle laws, mostly administrators and revenue officials. However, it was Sir Henry Main along with Karl Marx who could, should be credited with drawing the Indian village into mainstream of English thought. The continuing debate over the historical primacy of the village community in India turned out to be decisive impetus of academic elucidation of village in general social theory. Towards the end of the century, the debate initiated by Maine led to encyclopedic labors and muddled thinking of Baden-Powell. In a way, Baden-Powell, the discussion surrounding the Indian villages concludes. According to Maine, India had a curious relationship with Europe. In his lecture on the effects of observation of India on the modern European thought at Cambridge in 1875, he convinced that India shared with Europe a whole world of Aryan institutions, customs, laws and beliefs. India was thus a part of that very family of mankind to which Europeans belong. Yet those Aryan institutions had been arrested in India at an early stage of development. As a consequence, unlike civilized Europe, India remained at the level of barbarism despite its intimate connections with Europe of the year. So, India and Europe were fundamentally implicated with each other in a common origin yet paradoxically different. Four main societies were different and histories had shaped the path that each had taken. He reasoned that India's ancient institutions linked to those of Europe by the common Aryan origin became the germs out of which social and political system of modern Europe had emerged. Seen thus, Indian institutions were not merely curious anachronisms but contained in themselves the making of successive phases of one ongoing process of development. However, in order to justify making inferences from India's present to India's past, men had inevitably to assume that India had had no history since the time of the early Aryan invasion. In effect, he gave India with one hand a history linked to that of England, with the other he took it away. The dichotomy between India's static policies and England's progress ultimately overwhelmed any sense of parallel development that he could have argued otherwise. Central to Maine's analysis alike of India's similarity and its difference was his conception of the village community. By Maine's time, the notion of the village community had already acquired an extended history both in India and Europe. Several current views, German romantics sought national origins in the Teutonic forest. Victorian liberals too concerned of the Saxon village community as a training ground for all subsequent self-government. 
At the level of practice, Maine was in favor of curbing the movement, which was endeavoring to precipitate Indian society from status to contract at one bomb. In his theory of Indian village, he remained in prison to the growth of evolutionary thought, which he had characterized as stage. He describes India's brotherhood villages as marking out the earliest phase of an evolutionary process, whose end point was to be found in contemporary England. He went on to pronounce India's present village communities to be identical with the ancient European systems of enjoyment and tillage. Like Maclev's vision of the village republic, Maine's theory had little place for the state or for caste. Thus, for Maine, institution of village had embodied that which at once intimately linked and yet separated India and Europe. The fact that Maine had a linear scheme of evolution for the village community and that he suppressed inconsistencies in his own data have frequently been pointed out. What mattered to him was in the end not India but Europe. We should note that for men the village was subsumed under the history of property regimes. His principal objective was always to explain Europe's historical development that in a way inextricably connected civilization progress and private property rights. He looked at India's village as a corporate body having common ownership of soil. This meant that this village has not progressed beyond the infancy of civilization. Logically, Maine treated them as survivals from Indo-European past and evocative of Roman gens for co-ownership of soil marked the infancy of law and civilization. This is not to say that he had contempt for them. Rather, as an organized society, the village community, besides providing for management of the common fund, it seldom fails to provide by a complete set of functionaries for internal government, for police, and for the administration of justice for the appointment of taxes and public duties. Two main simple forms of village are joint brotherhood. Also, he sees village communities as democratic and egalitarian in the political sense. His preoccupation with the community as an independent institution was largely responsible for its neglect of the state in relation to the village. And finally, he always confused between the co-shares of the soil and the village population as a whole despite empirical evidence to the contrary. Since Maine believed that movement of all progressive societies had been a movement from status to contract, village community presented itself as a primitive social organization to him. It was primitive because it was characterized by primitive form of property, that is, land was held in common. Thus, in Maine's line of reasoning, village community and collective property were seen as inseparable. After all, ancient law did not recognize the individual. It knew only of groups and the typical property-owning groups in the olden times were the village community. By virtue of equating village community with the communal ownership of land, Maine could add a sharp edge to his thesis that historical development of property in land has been a movement from collective to individual forms. At any rate, Maine's theory of the village did not arise from any intrinsic interest of the history of India as such, but was inspired by the assumption that a local system could be found in the Orient similar to that which had existed in Europe's distant past. His analysis of the development of legal traditions in the East and the West could be seen against a background of the evolutionary theory that has such preeminence in the late 19th century. Marx and the Asiatic Stagnation Maine had a predecessor in Karl Marx from, for whom social stagnation was the hallmark of the peasant community. Marx's discussion of the Asiatic mode of production too betrays an evolutionary reading of Indian history. His views on village community appear primarily in his newspaper writings on the British rule in India, save a few passages in capital. Despite his utter content, Marx did consider Indian village to be the heart of the Indian social system. This explains his rejoicing over the British rule in India. He believed that while previous conquerors had effected no more than political change, England had brought about a social revolution by striking at the heart of social system, the Indian village. English interference dissolved all these small semi-barbarian communities by blowing up their economic bases and thus produced the only social revolution ever heard of in Asia. For him, the laying of the material foundation of Western society in India-Asia was linked to the dissolution of the village. Since the village was a repository of all these characteristics that lay at the root of Asian stagnation, the work of regeneration of India had to proceed through a heap of ruins that is village community. Marx held that pre-colonial India had no history. Indian society has no history at all, at least no known history. What we call as history is but the history of successive intruders who found their empires on the passive basis of that unresisting and unchanging society. However, as Anderson has argued, Marx's explanation of the situation has varied somewhat between the, his different writings. So, for Marx, there was no separation of the cultivating householder from the village to which he belonged. Secondly, there was an absence of the division of labor in the village. 
that is to say village could manage itself almost all the trades and the crafts required for it to survive and reproduce itself this was a major reason for the unchanging character of indian village finally there was no notion of private property in the village village was not separate from the land held in common in effect mass reinforced the widely prevalent idea that in the indian village and in asia in general community is a real substance of which the individuals were mere accidents the empirical inaccuracy of mass description of village has often been noted like main he did not allow the then available empirical evidence to affect his theory in his characterization of indian society as a static incapable of significant internal development and devoid of history he studiously overlooked campbell's account the latter was a serious empirical challenge to marx's general theory on ground rent and consequences of money rate according to marx all pervasive rent in kind provided the basis of stationary social conditions in asia Nonetheless, Marx's idea of unchanging Asia and unchanging Indian village contains contradictions. They point out that Marx's denial of the possibility of significant indigenous historical development in India only continued a strong European tradition. Anderson writes the nature of Marx capital itself does remain substantially faithful to the classical European image of Asia which he had inherited from a long file of predecessors he showed that the image of a stagnant Asia cannot be fully sustained on the Asiatic mode of production which the idea of unchanging Asia is ultimately linked should be given a decent burial it deserves Baden Powell and the Rotwari village the Baden Powell's evolutionary list tainted classifications also suffered from orientalist prejudice his contribution to the study of indian village is seminal on the basis of data contained in the mass of gazetteers and land settlement reports of 1870s and 1880s he insisted that village community had never enshrined communal ownership of land and was not an aryan institution also there was not single typical ideal of the indian village highlighting the heterogeneous patterns of land holding he posited there is a bewildering variety of village communities in india following his conviction that india was fundamentally dravidian rather than aryan culture baden powell argued that roitwari village had had originated in a tribal state of society this type of village had come into existence much before the arrival of aryans in india In fact, Rajwari village was a result of the decay or dissolution of pre-Aryan Dravidian clan system. He further believed that several villages were shared by the social requirements of indigenous Dravidian and Aboriginal people. More importantly, he, by asserting that the typical Indian village was a Dravidian institution, he reversed a sequential precedence of joint over several villages as Dravidians are an Aboriginal people precede Aryans in India. Furthermore, Baden Powell broke with the idea that Indian village was inherently democratic republican in its constitution he challenged the notion of communal land holding in the village and disputed the assertion that all the members of the village were at least in origin members of a single clan or brotherhood thus baden powell advanced two interrelated arguments that there are two types of villages in india two jointly held villages of the aryans taken to be the universally and essentially indian type the ideal typical indian village is quite misleading Contrary to what Marx and Main had said for Baden Powell joint villages are not a widely distributed type of village rather they were confined mostly to north india what had been typical instead was a rightwari several type of village friends in conclusion to this module titled peasant and the raj 2 we have really looked into how the 19th century thinkers have really conceptualized the concept of village and in this module after discussion we have looked into two important aspects one how village has developed as an important concept especially in terms of revenue assessment further we have also looked into the idea of village as an evitable arena of states mapping of agrarian territory thank you